Hello. Um, today we're going to start chapter five, and uh, I'd like to begin by uh, saying in this chapter we'll talk about how to make an atomic bomb. Uh, hopefully, um, none of you will take me up on this, but uh, that's what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Uh, so when we talk about atomic bombs, the first thing we should talk about is um, in the ground there is an ore, and if you go to the right place, you can dig out uranium from the ground. And here are some pictures of uranium. Uh, we have some uranium ore, uh, some processed uranium, and what it looks like after it's been processed for a while. But you can dig uranium out of the ground. And we can, of course, use uranium uh, if we do the right things to it to make an atomic bomb. Here's a picture of um, a site where um, a uranium mine is, where they've dug uranium out of the ground. And the thing you should know is, when we get rid of all of the junk rock, and you're just left with uranium, most uranium, uh, the atom of the uranium, uh, weighs 238. So it has you know, um, a bunch of protons and neutrons that add up to 238. And that's most of uranium, 99.3% of all uranium. The uranium that is of more interest to us for an, an atomic bomb is uranium-235. Um, about 0.7% of all uranium weighs 235. So 99.3% of it is stuff I don't need for an atomic bomb, but 0.7% is something I will use for, an, a bomb, for a bomb. The reason is there's something special about uranium-235. Um, it can divide, if a neutron hits it, it can divide into two, break apart into two smaller atoms, give off a bunch of energy, and release some more neutrons. All right, so if very little of our uranium is the important uranium I need, 235, then I have to figure out a way to separate it or purify it from the uranium-238. I need a way, a way to, to get more uranium-235 and concentrate it. We find that unless I concentrate it, I can't make a bomb. Well, that's very difficult to do because I'm trying to separate uranium from uranium. You see, it's easy for me to separate uranium from some other element like um, neptunium or carbon or you know the, the other parts of the rock it's in. Uh, I can use chemistry for that, and I'm a chemist, and that's pretty easy to do. But to separate uranium from uranium, it has all of the same chemistries, so it makes it very difficult to separate and purify. So we have to get clever. And this was back when World War II was going on. We tried to figure out how can we purify uranium to make enough of it to maybe make a bomb. So what we ended up using was the, the idea that uranium-238, since it weighs just a little bit more than uranium-235, we thought if we could get it moving, um, uranium-235 being smaller can move just a little bit faster than uranium-237. So we can use this to our advantage. So for instance, sometimes um, we can um, just accelerate the two and then collect the stuff that comes off at the end, and that, or at the beginning, that would be uranium-235. Another way they do it is what you see here. You see this big C? Uh, this is called a calutron. Uh, Ernst Lawrence uh, helped discover this at the University of California. That's why it's called a calutron. And this, it's a big U-shaped uh, or a C-shaped uh, instrument. What it would do is it would create a magnetic field, and we would insert and accelerate our uranium particles into it. And the uranium-235, we could bend it faster with the magnetic fields than uranium-238. The heavier 238, it was harder to bend it. So, it. so what would happen was we'd bend the 235 quickly, and we could collect it at the bottom, and the 238 would come out at the top. And if we ran that long enough, slowly but surely, we can begin to purify and concentrate the uranium-235 that we need. Uh, this is one of the easiest ways to purify uranium. And uh, on the right here is a picture of a calutron that was dug up after the first Gulf War uh, in Iraq. Uh, the first Gulf War was Saddam Hussein, and they were talking about weapons of mass destruction, and destruction, and they found um, that he had calutrons buried, so he was purifying uranium, and he had enriched it 10% or so. Um, after the second Gulf War, uh, they would thought he, so there was proof after the first Gulf War that he had been purifying uranium. 
So uh, George W. Bush and the folks, they thought that he was purifying uh, uranium again, uh, but they didn't find these after the second Gulf War. But there is evidence we found that he was purifying uranium uh, for the first Gulf War. There are other ways of purifying uranium. The way you hear about mostly now are called centrifuges. And these centrifuges are the Libyan ones that were discovered in 2003. Um, again, Iran's talking about using centrifuges to purify uranium. Most of the time they talk about purifying the uranium, uh, enriching the uranium, they call it, for uh, nuclear power plants. Um, but um, so the way a centrifuge works is it spins very, very fast. And the things that are heavier spin to the outside more. And the things that are lighter stay on the inside. And then so they can separate uh, the different types of uranium that way. Um, probably a, a large lecture hall, if you fill it up with uh, centrifuges, could um, enrich enough uranium uh, to make all kinds of bombs, make many bombs. So uh, centrifuges become more dangerous because they can, they're smaller and um, a rogue nation could hide them uh, much more easily uh, if they wanted to. The other thing I want to say is uranium-238, the one that's most of uranium, 99.3% uh, of it, uh, we can use that in um, some power plants. And uranium-238, when it uh, is hit with a neutron, uh, the neutron can stick to it, make it weigh one more, and it becomes uranium-239. And It can decay to neptunium-239, and then become plutonium-239. I say this because plutonium-239 is also interesting. We can also make an atomic bomb out of plutonium, um, or I think maybe the uh, flux capacitor in uh, Back to the Future used plutonium. Uh, but plutonium can be used to make an atomic bomb. So um, we get plutonium from the remnants after a nuclear, um, uh, their nuclear reactions in an atomic bomb. Uh, you can get plutonium that can be made into a bomb. Uh, Interestingly enough, there is uh, a site in Africa called Gabon, I guess it's Gabon, and that's a place where at one point we discovered some uranium that seems like it had been enriched a little bit. Um, we also found some plutonium there. So we thought at first maybe somebody was, um, maybe we found the remnants of like uh, some kind of uh, nuclear testing and maybe somebody was about to make a bomb. Uh, where you find plutonium, you start to wonder about things like that. But it end up, ended up that there was some uh, uh, concentration of uranium and enough groundwater, and just all, and there was some carbon there on graphite, just all the right conditions that a spontaneous nuclear reaction, like happens in a power plant, occurred. Um, so it occurred over you know a thousand or maybe two thousand years, and what we see today is the remnants of that nuclear reaction that had occurred. It was probably the first natural nuclear power plant. Um, but we did find some plutonium there. So sometimes you find it naturally, but most often we find it in an atomic, or after a nuclear reactor. There are other places, like uh, um, there are reactors called breeder reactors, we'll talk about more later. But a breeder reactor can use that plutonium, so it's the waste product of a uranium nuclear power plant. Um, we can take that plutonium and we can use it again in a nuclear reactor um, and um, and keep it going. So there is a use for plutonium. You can recycle it and make more atomic reactors occur, nuclear reactors occur. Uh, those are called breeder reactors. We don't have those in the United States, but they do have those overseas. Okay, now, once we have our uranium-235, we've purified it. Uh, so we've enriched our uranium. So it doesn't have to be totally pure, but we have more uranium-235. Here's what happens. Um, if a neutron hits uranium-235, it a thing happens that's called fission. And fission is when this big, unstable um, uranium, when it gets one more neutron in it, it just falls apart and falls in half. So in this example, it falls into two smaller pieces. The nucleus breaks apart. That's what we call it a nuclear reaction. The nucleus of the uranium atom falls apart into two pieces. It roughly breaks apart in half. And in this case, the, uh, it shows krypton and barium was made. But when that happens, a bunch of energy is given off. And the other thing is, when it breaks apart, it doesn't totally break apart evenly. On average, just under three neutrons get shot out as well. 
So one neutron comes in to cause it to break apart and give off energy, but then three more neutrons goes off. Now if those three neutrons just go off into space and don't hit anything else, the reaction just dies and we get a little bit of energy. But imagine if we push the uranium close enough together that before that neutron gets out and shoots off into, into just nowhere into space, imagine one of those three neutrons hits another atom, hits another nucleus, causes it to split apart, and those three neutrons go off and they would fly away. And maybe one of those hits another uranium, causes it to fall apart. So if I get enough uranium close together, one out of those three neutrons could keep hitting another one, and the reaction could go like a chain reaction, one after the other after the other. And if it does that, just one at a time, I can just keep the reaction going, keep it self-sustaining, and keep getting energy out of it. But if I wanted to blow up like a bomb, what I really want to do is get a whole bunch of that uranium real close together so there's a bunch of nuclei real close. So then when those three neutrons go out, instead of just one hitting, all three may be hit. So if I can hit two or three hit, if, let's say it's two, then I could double the reaction. And then I could double it again. Then I could double it again. And if I could double it enough times, I can have a huge reaction, a huge explosion. So the key is to keep a whole bunch of uranium close together and we get a, enough of a mass together, not just a critical mass where it keeps going, but a super critical mass, an extra amount, where two or three of these neutrons keep hitting two or three more atoms, and the reaction can just become a huge explosion and go, give off a tremendous amount of energy. Now some things to think about. These smaller bits of uranium, or that the uranium breaks into, these daughter ions, uh, the daughter nuclei, the krypton and barium, and um, these other smaller nuclei, they're radioactive. So when this bomb blows up and it settles, we have all these parts, all these pieces of the, of the fissioned uranium that are left over, and they keep giving off radioactivity and can be dangerous for us. So two things happen. An atomic bomb gives off a tremendous amount of energy, and it gives off some radioactivity because of the uranium and the daughter particles are all radioactive. All right, so to review. One neutron hits uranium-235, it falls apart, so I need one neutron to get it started. It falls apart, gives off energy, and gives off three more neutrons. If those don't hit anything, the reaction dies. If one hits another one, and it splits, and one hits another one, that's called a critical mass, just enough uranium to keep the reaction going. But if I have a supercritical mass, and I can get enough of it together for long enough before it all blows apart, I can have it double several times, maybe about 80 times, and the reaction can be much bigger and give off a lot of energy. So, how much uranium does it take to put in one space in order to make this happen? Well, in World War II, um, Warner Heisenberg was a brilliant scientist. Um, he was working for the Nazis. And Heisenberg did a calculation, and he, would, he calculated it would take 440 pounds of uranium-235 in order to have a critical mass. Well, that would take, would take 31 tons of uranium, to get that 440 pounds of uranium-235. Remember, only 0.7% of it is uranium-235, of all uranium. And 440 pounds of it would just be too big amount of uranium to fit into the bomber. So the Nazis pretty much were giving up on it. They said, we can't build a bomb like this. It just, it would be impossible to do. At the same time in America, all of our scientists went to the Manhattan Project um, out in um, New Mexico, and they started to work on this project as well. But they had a good idea. They said the reason Heisenberg made a mistake, they said Heisenberg's problem is, Heisenberg said, well, how much uranium do I need to get together if those three neutrons, if I want them to hit more nuclei, I have to have a whole bunch of nuclei together so those neutrons don't just escape. I have to add 440 pounds together in order for me to hit another one. But we said, well, that's just in case the, so the neutrons don't escape from this pile of uranium. But what if we surrounded it with kind of like a mirror, and the neutrons would bounce off, and then they would turn around and come back in. And so instead of just letting them all escape, I could reflect those neutrons and make them come back in. And then I could have a smaller amount of uranium, and I'd be more likely they might hit something. That was the key. So we put reflectors in our bombs. And we would reflect those neutrons back in so we could use a much smaller amount of uranium. So this goes to show you don't just give up when you hit your first stumbling block. 
we keep thinking about a solution, and a lot of times there is a solution to it, uh, the problems that we face. So this is the first type of bomb we dropped uh, in World War II. This is called Little Boy. It was the nickname for it. And it's a gun design. So it's kind of a skinny. This is the actual bomb before we dropped it on uh, Hiroshima. So here's the way we did it. We, you don't want to take all your uranium and put it all together at once and have a critical mass. So the way they did it was they took um, basically two bullets of uranium. They took that critical mass and they separated it into two parts. And they had, you know, a cylindrical part and kind of a hollow part. And then what they did was inside of here there's a long tube, kind of like the barrel of a gun, hence the gun design. We set off an explosive whenever we we're ready, we're ready, when we drop the bomb, then we detonated an explosive inside of the bomb. And what happened was it blew the cylinder all the way down to here and the cylinder went inside of the of the tube. And when that happened, we had a supercritical mass of uranium, and it could take off and it blow up like a bomb. The first bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima uh, was about equal to 15,000 tons of TNT, 15 kilotons of TNT. So that means if you take TNT dynamite, you had 15,000 tons of it, 15,000 tons of it, and you blew it up all at once. That's how much energy was released from Little Boy. Now, of course, um, that wasn't the only bomb that was dropped on Japan during World War II. There was another bomb. And the other bomb um, uses plutonium. So uh, we also made another type of bomb that used plutonium. Now plutonium, you don't need quite as much plutonium as you do uranium. The critical mass is much smaller. So for instance, you could almost get the amount of plutonium that fits into maybe uh, a coffee cup is enough plutonium to cause a bomb to go off. So here's how that bomb works. It's a little bit different. Um, a plutonium bomb, the way that we found the best way to make it work is to get a, an empty hollow um, shell of plutonium. So a, a basketball of plutonium, right, that's empty on the inside. And uh, what you do then is you want all of the plutonium to be squeezed together into a supercritical mass whenever you're ready. So what we do is we put explosives all around the outside of this basketball of plutonium. It's much bigger basketball, you know, it's a beach ball. And we squeeze it all together, and we have a neutron source in the middle. So we squeeze all that plutonium together, and we want it to hold together long enough to double uh, 80 times. If it doubles 80 times, then you'll get a big explosion. So really, it's much easier to get this plutonium. The trick is the engineering of getting all of this squeezed together and holding together so you can get 80 generations, 80 doublings to occur before it blows up. Now, Fat Man, this is the bomb we dropped on Nagasaki. You can see that it's much fatter, hence the name, because you have this big beach ball of plutonium on the inside with explosives around it and a neutron source in the middle. So it won't go off until we squeeze all that together to the neutron initiating source, and then it'll explode. Now, the bomb we dropped on Nagasaki was 20,000 tons of TNT. So Little Boy was 15,000 tons of TNT, and Fat Man was 20,000 tons, 20 kilotons. All right. Both of these were devastating. Of course, the Japanese surrendered soon after that. Um, okay, so that's how these bombs are made. So re remind, a reminder, uranium-235, the uranium bomb on Hiroshima was a gun type, and we squeeze the uranium together, and then it blows up. The plutonium bomb is a circle sphere that we implode, um, and then we have to get 80, gener 80 generations before it goes. Now this is the type of bomb that the North Koreans are working on. Uh, so like I said, we have to squeeze that together and have it stay together for 80 generations. It has to double two neutrons, hitting two uraniums, splitting. They, they hit four uraniums, they hit eight uraniums, hit or plutoniums, hit 16 plutoniums, hit 32 plutoniums. So you got to double 80 times to get enough generations for it to have a big bomb. Now, North Korea is trying to make these type. Um, their first attempt back in, like, 2006, we predict that they got about 70 generations uh, before, their, before their plutonium blew apart. Uh, that's, called, that's what's called a fizzle. Uh, so they got about 1% to 5% of what they wanted. Um, so compared to the bomb dropped in Nagasaki, uh, theirs was only about 1% as strong. More recently, though, uh, the North Koreans, looks like they may have just detonated one. Uh, we see earthquake uh, evidence, uh, so 
that's what we're measuring is earthquake uh, shaking to figure out how strong their bombs are. Um, the one they just recently uh, did here was like um, maybe close to what was dropped on Hiroshima. They're getting up to 12, 15 kilotons of, of TNT. Um, but it's very difficult. It's easy, kind of easy to get the plutonium. It's very difficult to make it implode properly, but it looks like they're getting closer. Okay, so that's how atomic bombs work. There's another type of bomb called a fusion bomb. So what we've talked about so far is fission, the splitting of an atom. Uranium splitting into smaller pieces, that gives off energy. Fission, atomic bomb, fission bomb, atom bomb. Some people call it nuclear bomb. I want to talk about fusion now. Fusion is when you take two small things and you squeeze them together to make one thing. So you fuse two things together. And the kind of fusion... Uh, so when you can do fusion on the atomic level, so you have two nuclei and their electrons, if you can squeeze them through the electrons all the way so those two positive nuclei can squeeze together and make something else, it releases a tremendous amount of energy. Where we're used to seeing fusion most is on the sun. On the sun, you can take hydrogen and another hydrogen, and they squeeze together because the sun has so much gravity, it squeezes those together and makes helium. Number two on the periodic table. So number one plus number one on the periodic table makes number two, helium. And when that happens, it releases a tremendous amount of energy. And because there was so much gravity and there's so much energy by the fusion, more hydrogens are keep getting squeezed together to make more helium, and it keeps burning. Eventually, all the hydrogen will be used up, and the sun will... Uh, well, it's interesting what will happen to it, but we won't get into that. But the sun will just expand into a, it'll collapse on itself, and it'll bounce off and expand into a red giant, swallowing up our solar system. But that's not for a very long time. Uh, Jesus will come back first, so don't worry about that. Uh, but uh, hydrogen, fusing with hydrogen, is what happens on the sun to make helium. Now, if we can make a tremendously powerful bomb, if we could take two small atoms and fuse them together, but you need the energy of something like the sun in order to make this happen. Um, where can we get that kind of tremendous amount of energy? So on Earth, what we've used is an atomic bomb to give us enough energy for a short, short amount of time in order to make this fusion occur. Sometimes a fusion bomb is also called a hydrogen bomb because it uses hydrogen in it, or a thermonuclear bomb, but we use hydrogen fusing it together. So now, we have developed hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear bombs, fusion bombs. They release a tremendous amount of energy. In fact, we've seen that they release up to, we have made bombs that we've tested that release up to 50 million tons of TNT. So I said Nagasaki, 20,000. 20,000 compared to 50 million tons. So this is like, what, two, two, over 2,000 times stronger than what was dropped on Nagasaki. Over 2,000 times stronger. Alright, so here's how a hydrogen bomb works. For a hydrogen bomb to work, there's two things that have to happen. First thing, we need hydrogen around other hydrogen. And they don't just use regular hydrogen, uh, they use special isotopes of hydrogen that weigh a little bit extra. So they have, around the hydrogen, they have, they have two types of hydrogen. So here on the bottom, you see hydrogen that weighs three. We call hydrogen that weighs three tritium. And hydrogen that weighs three tritium, uh, we get from lithium. The lithium, we use a special kind of lithium, which degrades into tritium. We'll just leave it there. Tritium's radioactive, so we don't just, we can't just put tritium in there. You have to put this special form of lithium in there that will degrade into tritium when you need it. We also have a hydrogen in there that weighs two. And that's called deuterium, is the hydrogen that weighs two. And you can get deuterium from uh, ocean water. Um, some deuterium, some hydrogen out there is deuterium. Um, so deuterium that weighs two, if it makes water H2O, if those hydrogens in water H2O, if those hydrogens are deuterium, we call that water heavy water. And a certain percentage of the ocean water is heavy water. So we can get deuterium fairly easy. It's not radioactive. Uh, we can get deuterium easily. So we put tritium, or this lithium, they'll turn into a special kind of hydrogen, tritium, 
and we put this other deuterium hydrogen together, and they're ready to be fused together into helium. Now, when they make helium, helium is perfectly harmless. We put it into balloons, um, so not radioactive at all. But in order to get these hydrogens to fuse, what we really need to do is we take an atomic bomb, we implode it at the right time, and that releases so much energy that these hydrogens, which don't want to go together because there are electron crop clouds blocking the way, and a positive nucleus squeezing with a positive nucleus, like charges repel each other, so it's like two magnets trying to get them together, but under enough energy, under atomic bombs worth of energy, the plutonium bomb squeezes and we fuse those together. So the atomic bomb would give off, you know, 15 kilotons of energy, but when we fuse those hydrogens into helium, it releases 50 million tons of energy of TNT. So that's basically how it works. Um, again, they put it in something that um, bounces gamma rays around to help the implosion, help the fusion to occur. Uh, that was a top secret thing up to a few years ago. Um, but anyways, I want you to remember that a hydrogen bomb uses an atomic bomb just to give enough energy to cause the hydrogen to fuse together to make a hydrogen bomb and release a tremendous amount of energy. Okay, I think that's probably a good place to stop. We've talked about atomic bombs. We talked about uranium-235, uh, gun-type bomb. We talked about plutonium implosion bombs. Um, and we talked about a hydrogen bomb. Those are the three ways. In the next video, we'll talk about how um, nuclear power plants work and how we can use, instead of uh, uranium to make a bomb, how we can use it to make uh, energy that we can use for a power plant. I'll see you next time.